Hello, I'm Molly Riley, and I'm a junior from North Shore High School, and today we're going to develop an understanding of the formal definition of a limit using epsilon and delta. Here's our agenda, and we're only going to be focusing on the bullets highlighted in green. The two remaining bullets are just background information that we had to research as a prerequisite. We're going to begin with the uh, importance of writing formal definitions. It's extremely important, especially in mathematics, to define terms rigorously so there's no room for misinterpretation. For example, let's try to define a tangent. One might define a tangent as a line that hits a circle at one point. That sounds like a pretty good definition at first. So let's see if any of these examples are tangents. C is not a tangent because it does not fit our definition. It's a line, but it does not hit the circle at any point. B hits a circle at one point, so could it be a, uh, could it be a tangent? Well, no, because it's just a line segment, not a full line. Now what about this example here? Could this line be tangent to the circle? It hits the circle at one point, and if it's our definition, therefore it must be a tangent. We know from our common knowledge of geometry that this is not tangent to the circle. So what we have to do is we have to alter our definition so it excludes this figure. So instead, we're going to find a tangent as a line that hits a circle at one point and is in the same uh, plane as the circle. And A fits this definition perfectly. It's in the same plane as the circle and hits the circle at one point. And now we understand that it's really important to have a specific definition of a term, so there's no misinterpretation. We almost defined this example of the tangent when it's obviously not a tangent. And we're going to do the same thing for limits. Before we go into defining a limit, we're going to understand what a limit is. And to do, the, to do this, we're going to use a real-life example. Imagine that f of x graphed here is the height of a ceiling. And at a point three feet away from the wall, the height of the ceiling is 15 feet. There are two people, Kate and Joe, and they both have these measuring devices that can measure the distance between themselves and the ceiling, and they also have cell phones, and they're communicating to each other the, their measurements. Now Kate begins to walk closer to this point that will clear in the ground, and she communicates to Joe that her measurements are increasing and getting closer and closer to about 15. And Joe does the same thing, he walks closer to that point, and he communicates to Kate that his measurements are decreasing and getting closer and closer to 15 as well. So they make a prediction that when they reach this point, the height of the ceiling will be 15 feet. But in fact, the height of the ceiling at this point is 24 feet, not the expected value of 15 feet. But again, this does not matter to us, because we only care about what we predict the height of the ceiling to be at this point, not what the height of the ceiling actually is. <coughs> but can we argue that Kate and Joe are approaching 14.9 feet, 14.999, 14. a billion nine feet? How do we prove that Kate and Joe are actually approaching 15 feet? To do this, we can use the formal definition of a limit. Now right away, this looks like, this looks very intimidating. It has some pretty complex variables and notation. So what we're going to do is we're going to dissect this and analyze each of the, com each component that makes up, uh, that makes up the formal definition of a limit. We're going to put this up here for reference. Is this too far away? No, it's good. It's good. <clears throat> we're going to begin with absolute value in neighborhoods. A 5 neighborhood of 14 includes all the values 5 above and 5 below 14. So it would include all the values between 9 and 19, but does not include the endpoints 9 and 19. And it is represented using this notation. A deleted uh, 5 neighborhood of 14 is the same, except it does not include 14 in the neighborhood, and is represented using this notation. We also have to have a basic understanding of logic. Basically, what we need to know is if we're given that x is less than 6, then x must be less than 7, but x is not necessarily less than 5. And now we're going to learn how to graph neighborhoods. The graph of f of x is shown here, and on the x-axis, we're going to draw in a deleted one neighborhood of 2. This means that the center of this neighborhood is 2, so we begin by marking that, and 2 translates to 8 on the y-axis, because when we substitute 2 into the equation, we end up with 8. And now we're going to draw in one above and one below 2, which is 1 and 3, and that translates to 5 and 13 on the y-axis. So this 1 neighborhood 2 translates to all the values between 5 and 13 on the y-axis. And now we need to become familiar with the variables that we need to know when we go into the formal definition of a limit. So we're going to draw in a delta neighborhood of A, a deleted delta neighborhood of A on the x-axis. Uh, the center of this neighborhood is A, which we say translates to L on the y-axis. Now we're going to draw a delta above and delta below A. And this translates to epsilon above 
and epsilon below L, which is an epsilon neighborhood of L on the y-axis. Now as x gets closer and closer to the value of A from either direction, we expect the value of f of x to get closer and closer to the value of L. But what if on x equals A, f of x does not equal L, and it's actually equal to a value completely outside of the neighborhood? Again, just like in our example with Kate and Joe, we don't care what the value of f of x actually is. We just care about what we expect the value to be, which is L. So now we understand absolute value notation, neighborhoods, graphing neighborhoods, and logic, so we can approach the formal definition of a limit. <coughs> we see that L is the limit of f of x as x approaches a if for any value of epsilon greater than zero, there exists a value of delta greater than zero, such that the deleted delta neighborhood of a maps into the epsilon neighborhood of L. So now we're going to demonstrate this definition using an example of f of x equals 3x plus 1. The limit of f of x as x approaches 7 is 22, and we find this by substituting 7 into the equation. But why isn't the limit 21.9, 21.109, a billion nines? It is true that as x approaches 7, f of x is approaching these numbers as well. So what makes 22 the limit of f of x as x approaches 7? So we're going to demonstrate that 22 is the limit using the formal definition. So our linear function is graphed here, and x is approaching 7, so we mark that on the x-axis, which translates to 22 on the y-axis. So is 22 the limit? Could 21.999 possibly be the limit? So we're going to mark 21.999 on the y-axis. Now in order for this to be the limit of f of x as x approaches 7, there must be a delta neighborhood of 7 that maps into any epsilon neighborhood of 21.999. So what we're going to do is, we're going to draw an epsilon neighborhood of 21.999. And now we're going to see if a delta neighborhood of 7 maps into this epsilon neighborhood. So we draw in delta above 7 and delta below 7, and it fits perfectly into the epsilon neighborhood of 21.999, proving that 21.999 is the limit of f of x as x approaches 7. But not quite. Let's go back to our formal definition of a limit. It explicitly says that for any value of epsilon, there is a value of delta, such that the delta neighborhood maps into the epsilon neighborhood. This means that no matter how small our epsilon value is and how small the epsilon neighborhood is, there will always be a delta neighborhood of A will map into that epsilon neighborhood of L. So now let's try this again, but with a smaller epsilon neighborhood of 21.999. Again, we mark 7 and 22. And here's 21.999. We're trying to see if this is the limit. And now we have a smaller epsilon neighborhood of 21.999. So in order for this to be the limit of f of x as x approaches 7, our delta neighborhood of 7 must map into this epsilon neighborhood. And this time, our delta neighborhood does not map into our epsilon neighborhood of 21.999, proving that this is not the limit of f of x as x approaches 7. In fact, this delta neighborhood maps perfectly into an epsilon neighborhood of 22, demonstrating that 22 is the limit of f of x as x approaches 7. Now again, this was just a demonstration of the formal definition of the limit. So now what we're going to do is we're going to perform a proof to show that this formal definition holds true for all examples. So we're going to use the example f of x equals 7x minus 4. The limit of f of x as x approaches 3 is 17, and again we find this by substituting 3 into the equation. But we want to prove that this is actually the limit. And we're going to approach this the same way you might approach traveling. Say you're trying to travel from New York City to Boston. Instead of looking at the, ro the roads leading from New York City to Boston, you might want to look at your destination first and see which roads lead from your destination to your starting point so you don't just start going any random direction. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to start at our destination, which is our epsilon neighborhood. We're going to work backwards to find our delta value that will give us a delta neighborhood that will map into the epsilon neighborhood. So begin with our epsilon neighborhood of L, in which f of x is equal to 7x minus 4 and L is equal to 17. So we substitute those values into the formula. We combine like terms, just uh, take out a 7, well, a sorry, divide both sides by 7, and we end up with an epsilon over 7 neighborhood of 3, which we can relate to our delta neighborhood of A, which A is equal to 3, and delta is equal to epsilon over 7. So now what we want to do is, we want to prove that when delta is equal to epsilon over 7, this delta neighborhood of 3 will map into an epsilon neighborhood of L. So now we're going to work forwards from our delta neighborhood of A to find our epsilon neighborhood. <coughs> so we multiply both sides by 7, distribute the 7, and now we want the expression within this absolute value sign to be equal to f of x minus L. So we need to somehow separate this 21 into two numbers that will give us 
f of x and l. So what we can do is we can easily separate 21 into 4 and 17, giving us our original epsilon neighborhood of l. So this proves that when delta is equal to epsilon over 7, this delta neighborhood of 3 maps perfectly into an epsilon neighborhood of l. So we're going to show this on a graph. f of x is graphed here, and x is approaching 3, and we are proving that 17 is the limit of f of x as x approaches 3. So when delta is equal to epsilon over 7, this delta neighborhood of 3 maps perfectly into an epsilon neighborhood of 17 with absolutely no room to spare. So what if we had a value of delta that was smaller? How can we prove that that delta neighborhood will still map into the epsilon neighborhood of 17? <clears throat> so for example, what if delta is equal to epsilon over 11, which is smaller than epsilon over 7? <coughs> so again, we're going to work forwards from our epsilon, from our delta neighborhood, and try to find our epsilon neighborhood. So we begin by multiplying both sides by 11. But we notice that if we distribute this 11, we'll have 11x. And that'll be really difficult to change into 7x, which we need in order for this to be equal to f of x minus l. So instead, we're going to scratch that, and we're going to multiply both sides by 7. So now, once we distribute the 7, we can easily have this expression mimic f of x minus l. And we end up with a 7 epsilon over 11 neighborhood of L. So what this means is that when delta is equal to epsilon over 11, this delta neighborhood of 3 maps perfectly into a 7 epsilon over 11 neighborhood of L. 7 epsilon over 11 is less than epsilon. So this means that a smaller delta neighborhood still fits into our original epsilon neighborhood of L. So again, we're going to show this using a graph. Here's our linear function and our limit and our original delta neighborhood of uh, 3, in which delta is equal to epsilon over 7, and this maps perfectly into the epsilon neighborhood of 17. And now we're drawing in our new delta neighborhood in which delta is equal to epsilon over 11, and this delta neighborhood maps perfectly into a 7 epsilon over 11 neighborhood of 17, which is still smaller than our original epsilon neighborhood of 17, proving that 17 is the limit of f of x as x approaches 3. So overall, we have successfully Accepted, analyzed, demonstrated, and proven true the formal definition of a limit using epsilon and delta. Some recommendations for further research from the first time in the math fair uh, was to analyze the formal definition of limit using other types of functions. So in my addendum, I focused on quadratic functions. And ultimately, what we found was that delta will end up e uh, being equal to the minimum of two values. The first being a stipulated value, and second being a value derived from a proof. So what this means is that if epsilon was equal to, say, 6, in this case, 1 is the minimum. So uh, the 1 neighborhood of 2 would map perfectly into an epsilon neighborhood of 4. If epsilon was equal to 4, then epsilon over 5 would be the minimum. So a 4 over 5 neighborhood of 2 would map perfectly into an epsilon neighborhood of 4. A recommendation for further research after this would be to find a function in which both of the minimum delta values work causing each delta neighborhood to map into the epsilon neighborhood of L. Thank you. That's all.